Hi, I'm Jessica Brown from the Centre for Independent Studies and I'm here with Professor James Allen from the University of Queensland. Welcome to Concilium. Hi Jessica. Um, look, you were talking in our discussion on political correctness and free speech. Do you think in Australia there is this problem of political correctness? I do, I do. I think there is a problem. I don't think it's as bad as in some other countries like Canada or, or uh, New Zealand or the UK or the US even, but certainly a problem, I think. And uh, I mean, partly it's a, a question of definition because different people use the word all over the place. So I, I, I think you can really collapse it down into three different things. Um, you've got the kind of political correctness that kills free speech or tries to stifle free speech. Uh, then you've got the kind of political correctness that usually is applied, or the label is applied to sort of regulatory overkill, the idiocies around needing to fill out a million forms for kids to use the uh, playground. Um, or, you know, I come from, I had 11 years in New Zealand, and, and uh, the, the level of, uh, the team of people you need to fix a road here is so different from New Zealand where you have one cone and people get on with the job. <laughs> so in a bit, that's, sort of, that's a much less important sort of political correctness. And I guess the third one is just uh, the loss of sense of humor. Mm. Just, there's things that people feel they can't say, they can't laugh about because they're afraid of the reaction. So those are the three. I, and the one that really worries me is the, is the free speech one. Where do you think this has come from? What's been the catalyst? I don't, I don't really know where it's come from. I, 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 um, I mean, I heard some of the other speakers speculating on that. I, I've noticed it since maybe the early 90s. Mm. Um, the first kind of political correctness, the kind that undermines free speech, was uh, defined by a, an American pundit. He said, really, it's a question of being hypersensitive to certain groups in society mm. amongst a certain part of the elite. And so you might be able to say whatever you want about um, flag burning or about you know pictures of Christ being displayed in art goes, but other groups maybe homosexuals, maybe uh, Muslims, you have to be much more sensitive. You have to be hypersensitive to their views. And so certain things are taken off the table and that just makes for bad policy, it makes for bad decision making. You, you ought to hear all points of view. And so really what we don't want is a, some sort of right not to be offended. And it's a group right, that's the problem. Yeah, so what do you make of the concept of hate speech? I mean, can we have a civil discussion if people are using this hateful speech? Uh, well, look, the problem with hate speech laws are that they uh, they take things off the table. Now, um, I can, I'm maybe old fashioned. I come from the school of thought where you just have to have a thick skin and suck it up. And, you know, there's some speech, obviously, that is going to be taken off the table. Even in the U.S. with incredibly strong speech protections, you can't counsel murder. So we're not talking about that. Uh, some sorts of obscenity are taken off the table. But when someone like Bolt, whatever you think of whether he's right or wrong, when he starts making comments about who, what sort of uh, self-declared aboriginals should or shouldn't get um, what effectively are affirmative action benefits, mm. Well, that's something that should be in the public domain. Mm. If you don't agree with him, fine. But how he can be dragged through some, through the courts, and and you know, often hate speech laws work not just by actually taking people to court, but by scaring other people into censoring themselves because mm. of the. F so it's not just whether you end up losing; it's the amount of money you have to pay. Now, Bolt's got a, you know, got a big employer who's probably. They, I don't know this, but they're probably picking up the tab for him. But there, if we look what happened to Mark Stein in Canada or the comedian Guy Earl. He got taken to court. He's a stand-up comedian. People pay to come and hear him as a comedian. And during the course of one of his shows in Canada, he got heckled by two women. It turned out they were lesbians. He made, uh, he responded to their heckling by making, you know, jokes about their being lesbians. And they took him to the sort of uh, speech police, the courts. Uh, they had little commissions there. He got fined a big amount of money and nobody hires him anymore. It was ridiculous. You know, I just think there's a real problem with this hypersensitivity mm. to group, to, and it's not everyone. As I said, if, if an American felt aggrieved that people were burning the American flag, his hurt feelings, would, he wouldn't be able to go to court. And most of the people who support the Andrew Bolt uh, court action, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say, okay, well, Americans who have hurt feelings because someone's burning their flag, they ought to be able to take mm. them. They wouldn't say that. And what's the end point of this? I mean, what, what effect does it have on the political discourse and the policy outcomes well I mean I think there's a tendency to censor yourself you got to fight that yeah I, I mean I made a comment here I remember last year at the CIS there was a reticence to you know 
the full-blooded discussion of the big Australia society, I think people were censoring themselves, which makes for bad policy. You, you know, they, you're just afraid that someone's going to label you a racist or a reactionary. Or, you know. Now, personally, that's why I make those comments, but it's not why everyone <laughs> makes them. It's, and you have to have a bit of a sense of humor and a bit of a thick skin. I know some people, I think, are just in the business of having, uh, of being victims. This looks like everyone wants to be a victim, not everyone, but too many people are, <laughs> are, are, you know, feel it's their life's work to be a victim. You spoke in your, in your presentation at Concilium about the latter-day Puritans. What, yep. what do you think of this? Oh, well, you know, there's, when you're categorizing people, there's all sorts of different ways you can categorize them. But one, one way is to call some people, uh, you go back to Amer the English Civil War and you talk about the Roundheads and the um, Cavaliers. The Cavaliers were noted for, you know, Churchill always wanted to be a Cavalier. Big drinking, fun, you know, they ended up losing. And then you got Cromwell's Roundheads, They're very puritanical, no sense of humor, uh, you know. They take everything to heart, and um, in some ways, it's a very unattractive worldview, mm. whatever you think of the English Civil War. So I just think there's this group of people, it looks like there's this group of people out there who s see themselves as sort of moral enforcers. I don't like it. Um, so, you know, we need to poke fun at them. Well, thank you so much for your time, Professor James Allen. It's been great Thanks, to have Jessica. you here. Thank you.